Hello, um, good afternoon. We are just waiting a minute or two for folks to join and then we will start our webinar. Again, good afternoon. We are now live. We are just waiting for everyone to join and we will get started shortly. Hello and good afternoon. Thank you for coming to another AHRI webinar series. My name is Mary Coben and I'm the Senior Director of Regulatory Affairs for AHRI. We have a webinar today for you on codes and standards unlocked. I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. First, we will have Mr. Jason Uberts, uh, who is um, the Director of Industry Standards and Relations for ESCO Group. He's a certified master HVACR educator. He currently serves on numerous industry committees, including the AHRI Safe Refrigerant Transition Task Force. He's a co-author of Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Technology, the industry's leading textbook published by Seneg, as well as author of ESCO Titles Gas Heating and Low GWP Refrigerant Safety. Um, thank you very much, Jason, for presenting today. And then we also have Anuj Minstry, who's ma manager of technical services for Daikin US. Um, he was originally with AHRI HVAC equipment certification and upgrading test standards procedure certification protocols. In 2017, Anuj went to Daikin US and now works in refrigerant and indoor air conditioning codes and standards and related issues and environmental issues, which he's very passionate about. He's the chairman of the AHRI Safe Refrigerant Transition Task Force Training Working Group and is also a member of the SRTTF Outreach Working Group and its Advisory Council. He's also the chairman of ASHRAE Technical Committee 6.3, Central Force Air, Condition, Air Heating and Cooling. He has a BE in Mechanical Engineering and an MSc in Industrial Engineering. Today, we'd like to go over the following agenda. We want to give you a regulatory background, a little bit about the refrigerants and the transition, and then we're really going to concentrate on consensus standards and building codes and how standards and codes fit together, uh, and then summarize all that information. So the first thing I want to chat with you about is the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act. The American Innovation and Manufacturing Act requires a transition to lower global warming potential refrigerants. It goes to reduce the supply of current refrigerants. Today, 10 states have already included uh, individual low GWP refrigerant regulations. Um, some of the likely AIM Act and state transition dates to low GWP refrigerants are the following. Today, we currently have plug-in appliances and light duty vehicles with low GWP refrigerants. We expect to see 2022 commercial refrigeration, particularly in California, 2024 commercial refrigeration in Washington State, also in 2024 chillers, 2025 residential and light commercial air conditioning, and 2026 remaining commercial refrigeration. And what does it mean, these new refrigerants? Many of the new low GO GWP refrigerants are ASHRAE A2L. What does that mean? All new refrigerants must be approved by the US EPA uh, through the SNAP process. By legislative mandate, EPA must consider safety, toxicity, flammability, and environmental factors before approving new refrigerants. So many of the new uh, low GWP refrigerants that are ASHRAE 2L will also have to be approved by the US EPA. Um, and those will be uh, subject to additional uh, safety requirements by the EPA. Currently, the US EPA allows flammable refrigerants in re residential and light commercial air conditioning as of May 2021, smaller equipment, window units and PTACs back in 2015, chillers starting as early as 2012, 
and self-contained refrigeration uh, even had a uh, SNAP listing of A3 higher flammability refrigerants back in 2012 and auto air conditioning back in 2011. And some key points about the transition from the AIM Act. Low GWP refrigerants are already being safely used. 80% of the cars sold in the U.S. already contain a low GWP refrigerant that's an A2L. And nearly all new European cars contain a low GWP refrigerant that's A2L. Air conditioning and refrigeration equipment in the EU, Australia, Japan, Thailand, and other countries contain low GWP refrigerants. And small appliances in the US are already containing low GWP refrigerants. And again, thinking about this transition, low GWP refrigerants will only be used in new systems or applications that are designed to safely use these refrigerants by mitigating the risks and where they're allowed by codes and standards. So let's talk a little bit more about this transition to low GWP refrigerants. What's the same? Well, the refrigerants are primarily fluorinated refrigerants. So combustion products for all fluorinated refrigerants are HF gas and HF acid after water is used. Um, oxygen deprivation is also possible in tight and enclosed spaces. Frostbite is possible to, due to quickly releasing refrigerant and PPE, including scuba, as a necessary part of firefighting. So that's all the same when we transition to the no, new lower GWP refrigerant. What's different? The refrigerant transition will require lower and higher flammability refrigerants to comply with these regulations, right? The AIM Act will require that. And lower flammability refrigerants or A2L refrigerants are characterized as those refrigerants having a low flame speed or burning velocity less than 10 centimeters per second and lower heat of combustion. These refrigerants um, really are very difficult to ignite. Um, some of the higher flammability refrigerants, including hydrocarbons such as propane and butane, uh, have higher flame speeds and, high, and higher heat of combustion. But again, they're also successfully being used in uh, certain applications. So what do I need to do about this transition? Well, particularly as we're concentrating on the A2L refrigerants today, we need to recognize and note that A2L refrigerants are difficult to ignite, have a low, slow flame speed, have a low heat of combustion, and stakeholders must be aware of and properly trained in mitigation of the risks due to lower flammability um, and uh, properties associated with the new refrigerants. And we're gonna go and look at some of those. So now let's kind of look about the, at these refrigerants. And I've been talking about A2L and I wanna just share with you uh, the refrigerant classification uh, so that you can take a look and see this. When we talk about refrigerants that we're using now today, we talk about 410A. And that's uh, considered by ASHRAE 34 an A1 refrigerant. And then we talk about some of the newer refrigerants that are gonna be as part of the AMAC transition. Uh, the ones that we're focusing on today are the A2Ls. That will be things like R32, R54A, et cetera. Again, as we look at this slide, we can see they're class 2L. They have low flammability and a low burning velocity, or flame front and lower heat of combustion. And compared to the other refrigerants that we've talked on or mentioned on or the A3s such as propane, which is also known as R290. I also want to note another refrigerant that we're not talking about today, but it's been used a lot, is R152A. It's a hairspray or an A2. So you can see that this refrigerant's been out in the market a long time, and it's being very successfully used. So let's talk a little bit again about the A2L refrigerant properties. A2L and A1 refrigerants have the same toxicity level. That's the A. A2L refrigerants, as I've been discussing, are very difficult to ignite. Um, they require a high minimum ignition energy or a very strong spark or a live flame uh, to ignite them. And they require higher levels of concentration to be leaked into a space to be flammable. They have lower flammability characteristics because they have a low or slow burning velocity. They have a low heat of combustion. And typically these refrigerants do not fully combust in a fire situation. What else is the same that I need to think about? Refrigerant concentration limits um, are used uh, all the time, right? And they're used to determine the maximum concentration limit 
in an allowed space of refrigerant. R410A RCL or refrigerant concentration limit is based on the toxicity. Low GWP refrigerants RCL will also be based on either the toxicity or the flammability levels. What's the same? RCLs are still gonna be used to determine allowed concentrations in occupied space and mitigation will be required when the refrigerant concentrations exceed the RCL. That's currently the same. What's different? R410A has an RCL of about 140,000 part per million, and most of you already know that. Low GWP A1 and A2L refrigerants have RCLs between 16,000 and 50,000. So what do you need to know? Well, we really need to know that mitigation will be needed before the RCL concentration is reached, and refrigerants will be based on toximity limits uh, that have lower RCLs may also require similar mitigation. But bottom line, the RCL will still be used to determine the refrigerant charge limits. Let's talk a little bit about A2L refrigerants. And I was mentioning earlier how difficult they are to ignite. So AHRI did a project, AHRTI 8017, where we looked at a lot of ignition sources in a residence. And we found with many, many ignition sources, there was no ignition when tested with these refrigerants. So a cigarette inserted into um, a concentration of refrigerant, a barbecue lighter. Uh, we looked at uh, plugs and receptacles uh, and shorts and a light switch and a hand mixer, uh, cordless drills, space heaters. And what we found was bottom line, open flames were really one of the only ignition sources uh, that we found that were viable or, or able to ignite the A2L refrigerants. We also found uh, potentially a very hot wire, um, but again, kind of hard to conceive that in certain areas, but these are the uh, ignition sources we found. And again, uh, very interesting that um, we didn't find a lot of things that could ignite A2L refrigerants. I just kind of want to show this to folks, uh, this refrigerant flammability property chart which kind of gives you a perspective of uh, the heat of combustion, which is the energy that's released when refrigerants ignite. If I look over here, uh, 410A, which is the common uh, refrigerant used for air conditioning and heating applications right now, I can see that it's got some energy when it's in a fire. Here's the amount of energy it would release. And if I look at all of my uh, A2L refrigerants that are in here, and actually even one that's uh, a B2L, ammonia, they're all in this same box. So you can see they all have a very similar energy release. And again, looking at the burning velocity or how fast a flame front would move, you can see that these are very similar, uh, not the same as uh, 410A or 134A that's used uh, in a refrigerator, but very similar. So again, you can see looking at the refrigerant flammability properties, the A2Ls are a lot closer uh, to A1 refrigerants. So again, how did we get where we are? Well, we did a lot of extensive research and looked at all of this uh, work on flammable refrigerants. And AHRI has been involved with this uh, for years and years as other OEMs and uh, manufacturers and third-party labs. Uh, the national uh, testing labs have been involved in this. And you can see uh, a good bit of the research here. And for a complete, uh, more complete list, you can look at the AHRI website. But again, I would wanna let folks know, uh, this is not uh, exclusive. This is not the comprehensive list. There's even more information out there. So just wanted to share with you that we recently completed, and it was our last uh, webinar uh, discussing um, work that we had done, particularly for the fire service. We looked at risk of, uh, of a system in a building fire with A2L refrigerants. And we did this uh, report for firefighters based on input for firefighters. And we went and found that, um, you know, again, A2L refrigerants are closer uh, to uh, A1 refrigerants. So with that, I'd like to uh, uh, hand this off. Um, to uh, my colleague, uh, Jason Overitz. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'd like to, to mention that if you do have a question, to type it out in the Q&A, and we will do our best to get to it uh, <clears throat> during the presentation. Uh, can we bring up the next slide? 
I'm going to speak a little bit about system installation uh, as it pertains to the, the new refrigerants, the, the A2Ls, the low GWPs. Refrigerant properties, along with years of research data, were used to edit and upgrade the codes and standards for these A2L refrigerants. Many of the safe work practices employed with uh, A1 refrigerants are still relevant when we're working with the 2Ls. Many of the differences that do exist are pre-installation safety precautions that primarily involve evaluating the installation site. The two golden rules to remember are, always defer to the manufacturer's installation guide and the authority having jurisdiction for the specific installation requirements and guidelines. Next. The maximum charge size for A2L equipment being installed will be limited by the cubic feet of airspace uh, served by the equipment. The space, uh, the space must be large enough and have enough air to keep the refrigerant at or below a percentage of the lower flammability limit or LFL should the entire charge leak into the space. The maximum allowable charge is not a universal figure and it will be different for every system installation and occupancy classification. The information has been thoroughly researched and has been laid out in the updated industry standards. To cover those codes and standards and how they function, I will now turn it over to my colleague, Anuj. Anuj, over to you. Uh, thanks, Jason, um, and good afternoon and, uh, to everyone, and thank you all for joining this webinar. So in this transition to low GWP class A2L refrigerants, codes and standards are the key to transition. Uh, let's begin with understanding um, standards first. So um, standards provide a definitive and a quantifiable measure of quality, whether it be in safety, reliability, or performance of an equipment. Uh, so standards also promote interoperability of products and services and, and remove trade barriers while promoting a common understanding of a product. Um, you know, they provide an assurance to the end user and help the manufacturer ensure that the products and, and material are built to effectively meet their purpose. You know, it is in a sense a mutual agreement between all the manufacturers and the end users. And every nationally acceptable standard is written by a committee under predefined rules and regulations that ensure a high quality and protection of end users. So next slide. Yeah, most important rule of writing an acceptable standard is consensus. Um, consensus generally means ensuring agreement of a supermajority of the committee um, and allowing time to raise, discuss, and resolve objections to any part of the standard. Uh, this is a sizable challenge for any committee writing a standard and perhaps one of the most time consuming requirements. A consensus may be recorded by a two-third majority, but essentially it's much more than that. A consensus means that all the views and objections must be considered and an effort be made to resolve every issue brought forth in that objection. Furthermore, a standards writing process allows involved stakeholders multiple opportunities to express their concerns at multiple times during the process. So for, for example, an interested party can make proposals at the beginning of writing a standard um, and, the participant, uh, and participate in discussions with the committee to discuss those proposals. They can then submit comments at the time of public review and comment periods. Again, uh, get a chance to either discuss and also the committee is required to respond to those comments. Um, and this process can repeat multiple times and you know, if the interested party is still not satisfied, they can file an appeal to raise, um, uh, file an appeal to raise concerns with the committee's adopted processes um, or inadequacies thereof. So this process is followed for every edition of the safety standard, um, especially in the air conditioning and heat pump industry. Um, and the standards such as the UL uh, safety standard 60335 40 or every new addition and addendum of ASHRAE standards, they all follow this consensus process. And, and apart, from, uh, apart from the standards um, writing process, uh, it also matters who is writing the standard. So next slide. So standards can be written by anyone or any organization, but the most effective and prevalent standards are written by established standards developing organizations or SDOs. 
Uh, each SEO can follow its own schedule and rules uh, to write a standard. However, when a standard is meant for use as a national standard, ANSI specific strict rules must be follow, followed. Now, ANSI is the American National Standards Institute, and it is an accreditation body. Uh, an SEO can apply for ANSI accreditation if it can demonstrate that it follows ANSI rules um, in writing standards. And there are currently about 50 ANSI accredited SEOs, a little less than 50, I guess, um, and they're operating in the U.S., and they cover almost every industry. Um, crucially, um, ANSI process rules are established to protect the end users. Uh, the rules prevent any singular entity or a group to become overbearing and lead to a, which can lead to a biased standard that may not be in the best interest of the end user. Uh, some of the rules include, you know, the method of organizing meetings, record keeping, maintaining a balanced committee, meaning that there be rep there should be representation from stakeholders involved in the business uh, and the use of the intended end product. Um, and there are other rules that you can see uh, listed on the slide here, uh, but also you can um, uh, review detailed rules um, on the ANSI website if you wish to do so. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so let's review how we get to create national standards. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's review how we, you know, get to create these national standards in the era of globalization and need for constant technological advancement. Uh, the World Trade Organization was formed in 1995 uh, when 124 countries signed and ratified an agreement called, uh, known as the Marrakesh Agreement. Uh, based on the place it was signed. Uh, the primary goal of the uh, World Trade Organization was to identify and remove global trade barriers. And one of the barriers was, of course, technical barrier. Uh, basically, the agreements direct countries to manufacture products to an international standard, but allows changes, revisions, differences specific to a country if the country chooses to deviate. So maintaining these standards allows for a common understanding of a product on a global scale. Um, now the international standards are written by committees under uh, either ISO, which is the International Organization of Standardization, um, and uh, or IEC, which is the International Electrotechnical Commission. Um, uh, generally, ISO focuses on materials and process controls, whereas IEC concentrates on manufacture um, and testing of finished goods. So uh, if you think of soldering or brazing standards, those would be ISO standards. Uh, but if you look at equipment safety standards, they would be written by the IEC. Um, and, and these ISO IEC committees have representation from all World Trade Organization participating countries, and US is one of them as well. Uh, next slide. So some national standards are actually derived from these international standards according to the agreement. Um, this phenomenon is very much prevalent in the HVAC industry. It is also used in the auto industry and, and a lot of other industries, and, and, and in fact, other countries. In fact, all world regions that use Class A2 l refrigerants actually certify to the IEC safety standards for air conditioning and heat pump systems are a derivative of the IEC standard. Now, for the US too, um, the safety standards for air conditioning heat pumps was first written by the IEC. It's called the IEC 60335-2-40. And then it was adopted into national standards with deviations under, um, an, uh, under the ANSI accredited process, um, an SDO, um, called the UL uh, standards. Uh, and uh, it, the standard is called the UL 60335-2-40. The number remains the same. The SEO changes, right? So he, uh, by the way, UL here doesn't mean UL certification and testing agency, which is the more popularly known um, uh, 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 agency, but the UL, it's the UL standards division, which is accredited by ANSI. So the safety standards for air conditioning heat pumps are actually ANSI standards. So it is parallel to how some other organizations actually work as well. Uh, in fact, uh, CSA is similar. They have a certification listing agency, but they also write Canadian national standards. And AHRI is another one that uh, actually certifies equipment, 
performance of equipment, but they also write their own standards and are, and are ANSI accredited. Um, so you will also find parallels in other countries and other industries, such as UK, Denmark, Japan, as they're listed here on the slide. Uh, next slide. So this is a visual representation of the interchangeability and relationships of some of the standards that apply to the HVAC industry. Um, uh, CEN, which is a new term here, um, uh, it's, it's the European Committee for Standardization, and it operates somewhat similar to the U.S. And as you can see, the national U.S. standard for safety of uh, air conditioning heat pump systems was adopted from the IEC standard. It is not directly adopted, as I mentioned. Instead, there are U.S. specific differences um, that are determined by the U.S. Standards Writing Committee. Uh, and um, it operates under the ANSI rules, just to be you know, clear. <laughs> These revisions are called national differences or national deviations and can be found clearly identified um, in, the, in the respective standards. Um, in fact, these U.S. national deviations are much stricter than the IEC standard, effectively making um, the HVAC systems that much more safer. But because of the, this matrix of relationships, it also fulfills the World Trade Organization goals of breaking down technical barriers. So you may find that products made in other IEC adopting countries have pretty high standards of quality and performance similar to the US. Uh, next slide. So now um, let's talk about you know, how safety standards in the US work. Um, you know, they create sort of a multi-layered safety net um, to protect the end user. Uh, safety standards can be characterized as either basic standards or product standards or somewhere in between as group standards. Um, sometimes basic standards are called general or horizontal standards and product standards are called application or vertical standards. Um, but, but the terminology itself is not all that important. Um, and it should be noted that there are different types of standards um, and the scope of each standard may cover certain aspects of safety. But because of this separation, you will find that multiple standards may apply to an equipment installation in a building. So US's concept of safety um, uh, and safety standards is quite strict. Um, the national deviations adopted in the UL standard, for example, are stricter than the IEC standard, which is already a pretty a good strict standard. On top of that, multiple standards can be applied to an installation because of this horizontal and vertical setup. So for example, a manufacturer makes a piece of equipment. Uh, first, it will need to be safety listed to an ANSI accredited national safety standard. In our case, it's the UL 2-40, uh, which is a vertical standard. Uh, and just to be clear, safety listing means um, it, it's a it's a third party lab certification for safety of a product to a nationally acceptable safety standard. Um, so it is being listed to a vertical standard. And then when it is installed in a building, it needs to be done so in accordance with another safety standard. In the, in the case of air conditioning heat pump, again, it is the ASHRAE standard 15, or it could be a building code um, which generally um, adopts ASHRAE 15 standard, and, and that is a horizontal standard. So this is analog analogous to a belt and suspender theory. Uh, next slide. So um, here's a small, uh, small sample of standards you know, relevant to the HVAC industry and specifically to the A2L refrigerant equipment. Um, you can see that there are already here three categories of standards, the refrigerant classification, the safety in use in terms of general and equipment specific categories. Um, and you'll notice that ASHRAE 34, which I've not mentioned in my presentation, was actually uh, described by Mary, uh, uh, which is the refrigerant classification standard. So next slide. So specifically, um, there are two very important standards for uh, the HVAC or AC and heat pump uh, systems in the US. Um, the UL 60335 2-40, which I call the UL 2-40, uh, it is a standard for household and similar electrical appliances. Um, and the ASHRAE standard 15, which is safety standard for refrigeration systems. The UL 2-40 includes product design requirements specific to electromechanical safety. 
um, and ASHRAE 15 determines um, uh, requirements for safe installation of those products. So the UL 2-40 covers many different types of equipment used in human comfort cooling and heating, and it is replacing, you know, a previously um, used safety standard, which is, uh, I guess, much more popular, uh, which is the UL 1995. Um, and, you know, we are currently in working towards uh, the fourth edition of the UL 2-40 standard. Now, we just want to share this information with you all because in reality, the technicians and contractors um, and installers, they do not have to worry about implementing them as much because it will be done at the manufacturer and system design level anyway. And additionally, all the important and relevant information will be available in the installation and service manuals, local building codes, and, and plus um, um, they will be uh, getting, receiving further training uh, training as we get closer to using A2L equipment. So next slide. Um, while the UL 2-40 that we just saw is a large standard, it covers electrical and mechanical safety features for a lot of different types of equipment, um, HVAC equipment. What is interesting is that the U.S. national safety standards have been including the use of flammable refrigerants and refrigeration equipment for quite some time now. Uh, so this this is not an entirely a new area for us. Uh, it has been happening in other equipment uh, from as early as 2000, as you see here. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, uh, Mary, Mary, if you could skip down a few slides to bring out the full picture here, please. Um, so this is a visual representation of what a product safety standard looks like or covers. Uh, specifically for A2L equipment here. Um, now, there are multiple ways to skin this cat, so to say, because every product type may have its own specific set of requirements that are specified in the standard. Um, however, one thing is common across all. The safety standard tries to reduce the probability of refrigerant leaks, um, and when it does leak, uh, it reduces the potential for ignition and a severe event. So additionally, it also requires that manufacturers apply labels and stickers and, uh, on the units to identify potential hazards and prescribe best practices for service um, and maintenance and requires that manufacturers incorporate all these, um, in, all this information and, and all these like uh, safety uh, best practice steps in their um, installation and operation manuals. However, for the contractor dealer group, again, it's, it's great to understand these safety features um, um, because it, uh, they, they will be working with this equipment on the ground. Um, and it, but you know, essentially product safety standards are implemented by HVAC manufacturers. Uh, and, and again, um, as Jason mentioned, you, know, you have to rely on the manufacturer's INO manuals and the building codes to get your most up-to-date information that apply to that installation. All right, so next slide. So moving on, um, another aspect of ensuring safety and performance of equipment in buildings is building codes. Um, building codes are also a means of enforcing safety standards or lawfully requiring them in the US. A building code, um, as it says here, is a set of rules that specifies the standards for constructed objects, such as building um, and non-building structures. The main purpose of a building code is to protect public health and safety. Uh, while product safety standards are implemented by manufacturers, building codes are applied by architects, building constructors, inspectors, interior designers, engineers, et cetera, and enforced by code officials or inspectors. Uh, this, there is a synergy between product standards and building codes in that the building code provides a standard of acceptance while the standard includes the details of requirements for individual products or aspects of that building. Uh, there are several types of codes. Um, there is a building code itself, uh, for there are mechanical codes, plumbing codes, fire safety codes, uh, codes for sewage systems and uh, zoning, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, lastly, you know, we should understand that uh, building code is not required to be implemented until it is adopted by a jurisdiction and converted into law. Uh, next slide. 
So let's, um, uh, so who writes these building codes, right? Um, let's try to understand where they come from. Well, there are two main bodies that write and maintain building codes in the U.S. The IAPMO, which is International Association of Plumbers and Mechanical Officers, and the ICC, which is the International Code Council. And there's another category of fire codes, which are also very important aspect of safety, and they're maintained by the National Fire Protection Association. Um, states and local jurisdictions can choose which um, building code um, uh, or a building code from which organization they want to reference or use. And it is governed by various factors, uh, but they're outside the scope of this presentation. However, one thing is same across the codes writing organizations. I don't know if that's a term, but you know we're we're calling it codes writing organizations, um, and it's similar to the SDOs. Um, these organizations must also adhere to um, a high standard of writing codes. They must also stick to procedures that allow for openness, balance, and consensus of stakeholders, and it is um, comparable to an ANSI process. Um, and, and these organizations, they write codes that are referred to as model building codes. So next slide. <clears throat> so codes are constantly being updated and new additions are being uh, pushed every three years of these model building codes. And you know, what are these model building codes? Where well, they're essentially an effort to harmonize building codes across the US simply um, because there is no building code at a federal or a national level in the U.S. Um, so with, with these model building codes, local jurisdictions could potentially adopt them and help in harmonization. However, you know, it is not possible <laughs> because local jurisdictions have their own revision schedules and options. Uh, so a local jurisdiction can actually decide to adopt safety standards directly or the model building codes or a combination thereof. So, but because, uh, you know, local jurisdictions timelines, also they do not align with model building code cycles and they tend, so they, they tend to adopt deviations and alterations to the model building codes too. So it's very important that installers and specifiers um, and engineers, um, they, they reference their local building codes whenever they're designing and installing HVAC systems and buildings. Okay, next slide. So, um, so now that we you know, understand uh, what standards and building codes are, let's look at how they all work together, um, uh, how they're all put together. Uh, remember I mentioned that the building codes reference, uh, they reference standards and standards contain the details. So in line with that, you see here that the model building codes um, are fed details about refrigerant safety requirements from various standards. Um, such as shown here as the ASHRAE 34, ASHRAE 15, and the, the various UL standards, including 2-40. Um, so primarily the building codes reference these product safety standards, um, and, um, and actually uh, building codes also require the use and installation of listed products as um, I described them earlier. Um, also, once the model building codes are determined, uh, they get considered to be adopted by the state, local, and or municipal uh, authorities, um, which once accepted become law of that jurisdiction. So all in all, this is a, you know, a good representation uh, of how a safety requirement traverses from an international standard, the IEC standard, all the way to our local jurisdictions and become law uh, of that jurisdiction or in, in the U.S. Uh, next slide. So this is this is my last slide, um, and it's just to show the audience of what sort of coverage an installation gets. Um, it's a very simplified representation, but to just kind of help everyone picture, um, uh, you know, visualize and, and sort of remember how it all is all put together. You can see um, that um, safety is ensured for the end user using multiple layers of codes and standards. Um, uh, it, it, it's a puzzle where you need to put, need input from all the pieces to make an acceptable end product. Um, so hope uh, you all have found this um, webinar informative and thank you for your time. I'm gonna take it back to you, Mary. 
Thank you, and it's really appreciated. And with that, I'm going to uh, hand it back off to uh, Jason uh, and with his experience uh, in the uh, uh, training arena and bring this back home for us. Thank you, Jason. Can you uh, uh, summarize for us? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, to sum everything up, <clears throat> The U.S. is going to be transitioning to these low GWP refrigerants. And in most cases, these are going to be A2L refrigerants, which for the most part, we can handle similarly to the way we handle A1 refrigerants. The technicians and industry stakeholders, all those involved, need to be aware of these new refrigerants, the updated codes and standards, and they need to obtain the appropriate level of training for their sector in the industry. There is a... Uh, already available training for technicians and uh, various levels of uh, the food chain, so to speak. <clears throat> always remember the two golden rules, always refer to the manufacturer's literature and the local authority having jurisdiction when it comes to any questions regarding an installation of a system with an A2L. <clears throat> the US EPA through the SNAP program evaluates refrigerant use for safety and use before allowing use in applications. The technical standards can be equipment, which are vertical, or installation, which are horizontal focused. Consensus technical standards are developed using the best processes with many stakeholders giving input. Many of you here today were involved in the writing and shaping of the standards that are currently in place. UL 60335-2-40 and ASHRAE 15 are both consensus standards. Both standards have been updated using the extensive research and findings from projects done by AHRI, ASHRAE, DOE, and NFPA. I would also like to stress that the training available by the various organizations uh, also receives it, its input from these projects and the results that <clears throat> were obtained. Next slide, please. So codes are a model or a framework, a set of recommendations for others to follow. We saw through Anuja's presentation that the standards and codes are related. The standards get into the more granular details of the equipment design and installation, and the codes are a larger overview of how all of this fits together. Building codes that are used in the U.S. are developed by IATMO, the International Association of Plumbing and Mechanical Officials, uh, the ICC, which is the International Code Council, or the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association. Standards and building codes will incorporate information on how to safely handle low GWP A2L refrigerants. And again, the training out there will take the information and incorporate that, or should, so that we, again, safety and use moving forward. With that, I'd like to send it back to Mary if we have any questions that we need to get to on air here or anything that's come up that we wanna uh, discuss. Mary, do we have anything? I think we do, and I, I do appreciate everyone's time today, and I really want to applaud our speakers uh, for all of their background and work uh, pulling this together. Um, Helen, I think um, there were some questions that came through. Can you please tell us um, uh, who has any uh, questions or what they were? Uh, Helen, can you please uh, let us know the questions? Uh, I'm looking. I think I saw... Okay, Mary, I have one for you. It says, uh, when will the, uh, the building codes uh, be updated to allow A2Ls in these buildings? That's a really great question. And I think what, what I wanna say is um, right now, we have some states that are already uh, allowing the use of A2L. Washington and Florida State are already um, uh, incorporating A2Ls. And we have other states that are uh, making what we call it, as Anoush said, um, People can do uh, deviations or uh, edits uh, in between uh, years, and we're already starting to see these going in other states. Uh, I expect in the near future we'll see it in other states, like maybe Connecticut or some other states to follow. Okay, one other thing that's come up is uh, access to UL 2-40 or 2-89. Where can someone who wants to reference those uh, come up? Now, I do know that those are standards available for purchase, but there are summaries and articles and things that are written uh, covering these standards and highlighting some of the uh, important provisions of the standards. But to view the standard in full, uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to have to uh, purchase it. 
Uh, yeah, that is my understanding too. But as you mentioned, uh, Jason, uh, there have been some very good uh, webinars and monographs put forward both by, um, I saw them both by Intertech and UL, uh, sharing information on what's uh, in the different sections. Uh, I know that AHRI has shared with folks a lot of the details that's in the uh, UL standard uh, and how it applies to the training manuals or some of the changes that people uh, will um, see and share. So we'll, we'll try and post more information on where that information can be found on our website. Anything else? <laughs> We do have one more here. It says, if it's within the purview of this presentation, could you discuss where the IATMO, ICC, NFPA process is currently with regards to A2L adoption? Um, sure, I think we can uh, give a thumbnail. You know, we're in the middle of the code process right now, uh, meaning that um, the technical committees from all three organizations, IATMO, ICC, and NFPA, are looking at uh, upgrades or changes uh, to their respective codes. And um, things are in the point where they've been looked at by the technical committees of those three organizations. And now we're going to the commenting phase, and then we will go after the public commenting phase, it will go through its official final round. So I would say um, we are in a process right now where it's in uh, gone through the first part of the phase and then needs to go through the second part with the uh, closing uh, part being held uh, between this fall and spring of next year. If that's helpful for folks. Yes, thank you. Yep, any other questions? Uh, I do believe we have one more. Are there any <clears throat> set known requirements for AC manufacturers to source regarding enhanced fire suppression systems, uh, exterior lo <clears throat> location of large volume refrigerant tanks, factory OSHA uh, worker OSHA requirements, et cetera. I think that is, I think that's a great question, and we really appreciate it from the audience. But I think that's a little bit out of our uh, scope and purview, um, uh, right, Anuj? I, I want to bat that one over to Anuj. I, I would believe that OSHA and PSM would probably be outside of this um, uh, on that. But can you speak to that, Anuj? Because you've been doing all the work on the building codes. Yeah, no, that's that's correct. Um, you know, we um, the the safety standards are generally um, related to the um, product design um, and uh, the. Um, yeah, this would not fall under the scope of the UL 2-40 standard. Okay, great. And Jason, do we note any other um, uh, questions come in to, to the chat line? There was one here. It says, are there any special considerations for transportation and or warehousing of A2L equipment? Um, yes, I would say that um, uh, this is actually being looked at. Um, AHRI is uh, looking at uh, what needs to be done as other uh, industry groups are. And I would say, uh, stay tuned. Uh, we're hoping to have more details uh, for folks. Uh, what are some of the changes coming forward? So I think it's on the horizon, but we're not ready uh, yet to share that information uh, with prime time, if that's good, if that's good for the folks on the line. It's, it's on our radar and people have been working on it, but we don't have the final answers. But when we do, we'll have a webinar. For sure. And I think that's it. That, I think that's gonna wrap it up. And again, I really appreciate uh, everyone coming today. I hope you've enjoyed uh, our presentation today, Codes and Standards Unlocked. I wanna give a big shout out to our presenters today, Mr. Jason Uberts and Anuj Mystery. Uh, really appreciate their time uh, and uh, efforts working on this presentation and all of their background, uh, pulling all of this together. So if anyone else has questions, please feel free to send them to AHRI, send them a care of me at AHRI, and we will look forward to uh, answering them. We will also uh, put this um, uh, webinar available on YouTube, and we will also uh, have the slides available for folks who want it. Thank you.